Brilliant. Thank you so much. I hope everybody can hear me clearly and there's not too much of a lag transatlantically. No, it's um, actually working very well. Fantastic. Um, well, firstly, thank you for the uh, talks already. Um, this series has got such a huge range of different specialities that I'm very conscious that uh, just the title of my talk may look fairly niche, but I'm going to try and uh, disarm some of the fear surrounding this and uh, just walk through a lot of the sort of technical things we've been doing um, to, to understand really the surface structure of the viral spikes. Now in my opening slide you'll see a, a wolf in sheep's clothing and I quite like this analogy because um, protruding out of the virus you obviously have viral spike proteins encoded by the genome of the virus but they can be modified by uh, sugars uh, which we call glycans and uh, these are sort of immunologically self if they're human derived. So in that sense, you have regions of the protein hidden by, by self sugars. Now, for those of you who aren't biomedical specialists, uh, I do mean sugars in the same sense of the dietary carbohydrates, but here, the whole field of glycobiology is really focused on how these sugars are used as structural carbohydrates and modify proteins and indeed lipids. But here we're focused on proteins. Now, viruses are extensively glycosylated and this shows uh, a series of viruses which have similar architectures, similar sort of attachment and fusion mechanisms. And you can see on, on the left, there's Lassa fever, one of the hemorrhagic fevers, Ebola next to it, flu, HIV and coronaviruses. And I'll be drawing um, a lot of lessons from these other viruses, in particular HIV, where we've been principally uh, funded to, to work. Now in blue, are the sugars, are these glycans. Now, the important thing about these modifications is I've mentioned that they're, the attachment points are encoded genetically, so they're not randomly distributed. And um, that means that the virus can actually use your host machinery to actually force modification of, its, of, its, of the, um, the viral protein. This is occurring in the secretory system uh, in, during translation into the ER, so occurring co-translationally. And the elaborations of the sugars, they get chopped and changed and diversified during secretion. And um, there's a few nuances to that, but the, in you know, the broad take home message is that it starts out simple, uh, so called oligomanos, and then becomes increasingly complex as it gets modified and matured. And then the, you'll also hear about proteases. These uh, proteins are also getting matured, not just in the carbohydrates, but proteolytically as well. They get, they get cleaved. Now, there are two types of attachment, uh, of sugar attachments. Uh, those occurring at asparagines, we call those sort of N-linked glycans, um, and those occurring at serines and threonines. Now, the, my talk is going to be principally focused on the so-called N-linked glycosylation. Now, that's um, purely because on these globular structures, that's a lot more common modification. Uh, the O-links are generally occur on regions which are like extended peptides. The transferases need, the enzymes that catalyze these things, need to access the peptides. So you, you generally see them on more extended loops. Um, sometimes, like in the case of Ebola, you'll see this sort of little halo of yellow there. That shows a whole domain of disordered peptide covered in O-links. But yeah, today, today we're principally focusing on, on N-links. Now this slide, really tries to encapsulate all, all the different themes that you get in broad viral glycosylation pathobiology. So actually illustrated here is Lassa, uh, Lassa fever glycoprotein. But whilst the sort of subtleties of transport and um, secretion all vary, the themes um, are shared by many viruses. So not all viruses will exhibit the same or be utilizing sugars in the same way. Uh, but there's remarkable overlap. And this stems from their role in assembly in the ER. So sugars uh, mediate um, chaperone, chaperone mediated folding. So there's a huge selection pressure on these viruses to have sugars, these end links, purely to enable assembly of the glycoproteins in the first place. And that's also connected to the high abundance of disulfo bonds uh, that these viral glycoproteins use. So there's quite a uh, quite a burden on the on the protein to be able to fold correctly so that's a really important in sort of endogenous functionality now the remaining categories i've illustrated here really um, 
spread from uh, their role in immune evasion. So these glycoproteins can be secreted as almost like decoys to the immune system. You can actually have sugars physically blocking um, the protein surface and that that is like the wolf in sheep's clothing aspect, this sort of hiding, uh, camouflaging. But these can also be uh, targeted in many cases by antibodies. Uh, we'll, illust we'll really sort of explore that in HIV. That's less common in these sort of hit and run viruses we're seeing, like a coronavirus. Sugars can be used as attachment factors. They can be um, targets for immune activation. Now, um, one thing I wanted to draw your attention to right here is this color scheme I've used from the greens the ER to the magenta for Golgi. Now, N-links undergo a maturation process from green, which would be these oligomanose glycans, to complex glycans, magenta. Now, this is quite important because this is intimately connected to the evolution of the innate immune system about how you can recognize wild glycoproteins. Um, if you consider yeast, for example, they're covered in mannose, these mannans, and your innate immune system is very good at recognizing mannose. So that means there's each cell in your body has, is really efficient at trimming back mannose and replacing them with other structures like silic acid and galactose. And that's that transition, that, that green to magenta. And we'll, we'll see examples where viruses are using so much sugar that they've rather overbaked it. And this maturation pro process can be, can be hindered. And that's gonna be quite important for, for many aspects. So obviously we're interested in the um, viral, actual infectious virus glycosylation ideally in lung and all the, you know, the actual biological locations of infection. But we're also interested in recombinant mimics of these viral spikes, native-like blood proteins. And my, the data I'm presenting here is heavily drawn on recombinant systems, but we can learn a lot from them. And they do capture some features of the native virus. But there's an important caveat to know that, you know, there is a distinction between uh, analysis of recombinant material and of to the, the viruses. So what can you learn from the recombinant material? Well, we'll see that you can learn a lot about immunogen integrity. In many viruses, it has not been very easy to make native-like mimics, and the sugars can be an interesting reporter of the native architecture. I mentioned that processing can be impeded because the sugars are overbaked. Well, if your um, if your recombinant protein, which is often used as a, as a vaccine candidate, as immunogen, if that's misfolded, that can impact that, uh, pro, you know, they, that processing. And so you can use sugars as a really sensitive readout of the underlying protein architecture. Uh, we also know that the processing of these sugars does it influence immunogen uh, trafficking. If you have captured that, those oligomanose signatures of uh, that can be present on viruses, that's going to influence how your immune system actually uptakes your immunogen. Um, and that's intimately linked to the resulting antibody response you might get against your, your recombinant protein. Um, you also have, obviously, the presentation of glycan-based epitopes. So some antibodies can target uh, mixed glycan protein epitopes. And in, in HIV, you can get entirely glycan-dependent epitopes. Um, and also, even though this is slightly um, sort of experimental system, um, the processing state can really reveal the degree of shielding uh, that the virus um, or how how, this, how glycans are being used as, as shielding by, by these viruses. Now a couple of other examples to really really motivate the interest in recombinant systems. Uh, we've seen already uh, looking on the left that um, the SARS-CoV-2 can uh, be targeted by antibodies that recognize mixed protein carbohydrates. Now in HIV, that took decades to realize there are antibodies capable of doing this. And it was really surprising to me that already we've seen um, antibodies capable of uh, recognizing these mixed epitopes. And also the, there's a really sort of interesting technical point here in that um, as uh, the previous piece we alluded to, the secretion pathway of coronaviruses is distinct from many other viruses. So whilst I refer to HIV quite a lot, that buds from the plasma membrane, whereas coronaviruses are budding into the secretory system. Uh, but despite that, there's evidence that they are capable of picking up modifications of the Golgi. So for example, 
um, this glycan is uh, seems to be targeting um, some glucose residues, uh, which are present as a Golgi modification. We also know from earlier studies by you know, using mass spectrometry on SARS uh, glycoproteins uh, that they exhibit the full range of modifications of the ER and Golgi, and there's a mixed population of mannose and complex. Um, and of course, um, going back to why we might be interested in recombinant glycosylation, um, the presence of mannose, and I've highlighted this here, a wonderful study that we're able to contribute to uh, by Dow Irvin in MIT, showing that immunogen glycosylation can actually influence the trafficking of your immunogen. So in that sense, there's even scope uh, potentially to engineer carbohydrates to enhance immunogenicity. Now, with the glycosylation pathway, I'm starting the ER in green, going on to the sort of complex glycans. I've included this to really illustrate that the early stages of biosynthesis are really linear. Um, they, they, there's some chopping off of mannose is done by a limited range of, of enzymes, and it's only later you get the diversification. Now, what lessons can we learn from HIV? And here, um, I just illustrated the sheer density of carbohydrates that cover HIV. And what we'll see is, um, you know, where, where there are parallels with what we've learned from HIV and where it begins to um, really dive, diverge, that they're quite different beasts. One of the most, well, the biggest difference uh, between the two, you know, two areas is because HIV is so antigenically diverse, you know, it's, even within one individual, it's, you know, much shows greater diversity than you would, you'd see sort of globally with flu or, or what it looks like with this coronavirus. But part of that is the conserved features that are presented for neutralization end up being these dense carbohydrates. And well, this is a structure from Ian Wilson's lab at Scripps Research, showing how these antibodies can recognize carbohydrates and really um, not targeting any variable component of the protein surface at all. Um, and the eagle-eyed amongst you will see actually there's a beta sheet forming with contact between the antibody in blue and its viral target in green. So it's really resilient to mutations. Um, but these types of antibodies are rare and they only really occur in HIV once people have been infected for quite a long time. And even then only in a fraction of, of people. So, you know, that's um, a lot of our background has been understanding how these, these carbohydrate epitopes are presented in, in HIV. Now I mentioned that the sugars are linked to the architecture of the underlying protein. And it was very common to uh, actually manufacture um, parts of viral spikes because until um, John Moore and Rocky Sanders and others figured out how to stabilize these viral glycoproteins, they could only be made as small little units. But this has big implications about the, the carbohydrate processing and that this is just a way of an analytical method uh, called UPLC for showing the percentage of glycans that are pre present in as these sort of oligomannose ones versus processed. Again, green versus magenta. And you'll see from the GP120 and even artificially trimerized um, GP120s uh, that there's a smaller component of green oligomannose compared to native like trimers, where suddenly you see a huge elevation in, in oligomannose. And that's true on the common proteins and in HIV, true for viral particles as well. So native-like protein folder induces native-like signatures of, of uh, native glycosylation. Now, we were interested in measuring these viral glycan um, um, on a site-specific basis, so what sugars attach to what sites on the protein. And we set up a semi-quantitative method uh, to evaluate that by um, mass spectrometry, which we've um, We've validated this uh, um, methodology in an earlier paper in 2016. But this has really given us a lot of confidence that we can get pretty informative consultation um, out of just LCMS methodologies. So inline chromatography into mass spectrometry. And this enables us to take that information and actually map on the processing state site specifically onto, onto a, in this case, onto HIV. Now, What's really interesting is you'll see clusters of sites which are mannose, red and green, and then regions which have shown much more processing and complexity, uh, like these complex glycans, red and magenta, and you even get mixed sites where sites are displaying both 
protect, you know, oligomannose forms and more processed ones. Now, looking at this, using this system, um, we can actually begin to map on changes in glycosylation back compared to these different formats. And you'll see a big rise in oligomannose that occurs at the interface of the subunits when they're presented in native, uh, native architecture. Now, I mentioned that sugars can be overbaked and they, they, there's too many to undergo enzymatic maturation. And here's just a model of the crystal structure of uh, one of the key enzymes, early en enzymes, ER manosidase, trying to chew its substrate, uh, shown in green, and shown in red are all the clashing glycans. So neighboring glycans and neighboring protein loops can easily knock off enzymatic processing. And that's how you get these oligomanos. That's shown in a different format here on the left, the so-called M-type lectins. You can see the, the gray enzyme here completely enveloping the target glycan. Now, there's a bit of a contradiction in that uh, mannose is appearing because of um, high density of sugars. And yet, I've just told you earlier that these sugars can be targeted by lectins. But you'll see on the illustrations here that lectins really bind to the tips of sugars whereas these enzymes are at the other end of the spectrum. So you can very much have a sufficient density of sugars to stop uh, mat glycan maturation, but they can be readily targeted by, by lactins and indeed by, by antibodies. Now, when we started looking at the SARS-CoV-2, we knew about the importance of this, this relationship between native protein architecture and um, getting valuable information out of the carbohydrate processing. And so we worked um, with Jason McClellan's group, uh, so Daniel Rapp and Jason McClellan at the University of Texas at Austin, and they provided uh, their construct, which contained um, the stabilized form of the, um, the envelope spike, truncated at the, uh, the membrane. So this is a soluble form, behaves very nicely as a trimer, and you can see by the electron micrographs in C um, that it's, it's very folded. So we had high quality, quite a quality material for site-specific analysis using our workflow that I've just uh, illustrated. Now, this is a horrible figure, I, I very much admit that, but I wanted to show that underlying some of the simplifications that I will be showing, that there is actually considerable heterogeneity. So each bar here represents a different glycan structure. But the important point coming out of this is that um, University of uh, Texas, well, the Texas lab made one batch of glycoprotein, which we analyzed. Um, we made two further batches in Southampton, and they are remarkably stable. This was in 293 um, F cells, but despite the complexity, it's a reproducible complexity. And that's, that's you know, really quite interesting how stable that is. Simplifying those categories down, so we're just grouping them by broad features of oligomanos in green versus a number of branches, really, on the complex glycans. You can begin to see some sites are are oligomanos and contain oligomanos, and then many others are, are fully processed. It's very similar to HIV, but we'll come on. When we plot that onto the surface of the spike, using this thresholding, so only showing sites that are really over 80% oligomanos as, as green, uh, we see that actually it's quite heavily processed compared to HIV, but we still have this you know, large region where there's an intermediate level shown in orange of, of oligomanos. That's slightly easier to visualize when we look at this sort of heat plot showing on, on the left here. And you can actually see the oligomanose glycans appear you know, across the, basically the base of the spike, but at much lower levels than what we're seeing in HIV. Of course, there's a sort of reciprocal nature between oligomanose, where enzymatic processing isn't occurring, and uh, complex, uh, complexities such as FUCOs. And here I've shown the site recognized by the antibody, and we're seeing almost complete fucosylation here. So we know that uh, recombinant, recombinant material can reproduce some of the epitopes that we might be interested in. And of course, we can mine the data for other features such as silic acid, et cetera. And they're all showing opposite relationship compared to the oligomanose regions. Now, bringing this to some sort of um, conclusions, uh, we can actually compare the coronaviruses um, in terms of their mannose uh, content from these recombinant systems and compare them to 
uh, other viruses such as and shown here in, in MERS and Lassa fever and HIV. And you'll see that they very much represent the, the lower end of that, that spectrum. Now this tells you that the, the overall sort of accessibility as, as illustrated by uh, the processing state of the glycans, they're much more processed. So this is more, more encouraging for antibody, antibody recognition of the underlying protein surface. Now, you can also correlate this with the actual order and structure of the glycans. And I've just put this here as a really sales pitch for, uh, for Zach working in Andrew Ward's lab at, at Scripps. And what he's shown using the, the first SARS strain is that uh, really the, using electron microscopy, the interconnectivity between the sugars on SARS is much lower they're much more isolated uh, sort of um, little sugar islands compared to HIV, where there's beginning to be an interconnectivity of the sugars, which you can actually begin to see by electron microscopy. And, and you know, this is you know, actually really beautiful work. Now, looking at this uh, in a different way, comparing the amount of mannose versus some measure of, of density, you can begin to, again, see that... Um, that spread and how the, the coronaviruses are indeed at the lower end of shielding compared to these these other viruses such as HIV or even flu. Now one um, just small point I mentioned about Olynx. Uh, here we, we, from HIV we, we can see that some regions that people find Olynx are, um, in really only occur in misfolded proteins. So in this particular case, um, at this, this region in 2499, uh, we see a bit of O-link occurring in G120, and that pretty much vanishes as we get to native live material. So we have, you can also use these other modifications to inform folding. And in fact, in SARS, we have one example of that. Um, people are seeing O-link modification in one particular region, which on the native material is almost uh, entirely unmodified. So where now? Well, I won't reiterate all the um, sort of lessons from, you know, why we're interested in the monitoring of the immunogens, but yeah, intimately linked to integrity, um, very important in monitoring the manufacturing and batch-to-batch -batch variation. Um, we are obviously going and looking ahead. We're interested in the vi viral glycosylation for as native situation as possible. But our lab is currently, because of this ability to make native-like um, spikes. We're supplying spikes to a uh, hospital in Birmingham uh, for serological assays. And one message coming out of that work is that when you use the intact native light spike, it can lead to incredibly sensitive assays. And we really think this is going to be uh, really quite important um, for sort of monitoring seroconversion in patients. So on that note, I'd like to thank uh, every, everybody, the funders, and many people who have contributed. I've highlighted in green the people who are involved, particularly in the Coronavirus 2 project, and uh, Joel, shown on the monitor, and Yasser on the mass spec, with a appropriately socially distanced photo. <laughs> so on that note, I'll uh, take questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Max, for a fascinating talk. Uh, um, I see there are already a few questions. Uh, Jahar? Max, uh, I was uh, just saying that thank you for a wonderful presentation. I was just really kind of delighted. Uh, as a lung biologist, I'm always wondering uh, what the targets of the lung epithelium are for, for coronavirus 2. And uh, uh, from the standpoint of uh, carbohydrates, there are immunolectins, heparan sulfate, salic acids. Which of these do you think would be the most avid target for? Uh, uh, and in, for for uh, visiting coronavirus uh, in, in the lung. Well, there's been some uh, lovely preprints from Keele University um, showing that heparin sulfate is a really good ligand, and I think that's been uh, verified by other groups. So, heparin sulfate seems to be really quite important uh, in it, in its interaction. Uh, I think the evidence for interaction with silic acid is less compelling. Um, um, this is not something I, I've seen the data personally, but from, from what I've seen emerging on Twitter with the latest uh, preprints, I think the weight of evidence seems heparin sulfate being the, the, leading, the, you know, the leading candidate. Would you mention lectins? Would you think of immunolectins, like Siglex, for example? Yeah, I think it's all, they're all going to be quite important. I mean, the, the, how do I put it? 
these we don't really know how uh, the virus is going to be modified in the lung right. but regardless of the outcome of that processing events there's going to be a whole range of lectins that are going to be targeting it so i think it's essential to consider uh, regardless of what actually happens if uh, the um, information we have holds up that um, these viruses do undergo some sort of processing then in, of course ciglets are going to be, become a major um, you know really significant thank you very much um wellington hi uh, uh, a wonderful talk and uh, my question is very related to the one that jahar has and um what i would like to know is uh, if there is any evidence, any new evidence about the role of the modifications of the heparin sulfate. We know that there are two old sulfations, uh, six old sulfations, and sulfations. All of these are important. And what's also interesting is that we have been always talking about the viral side, but how about the host side, which is actually the relationship with the question that Jahar has? Um, how is that this influences the viral uh, host uh, 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 interactions and uh, particularly this is important because heparin which is highly sulfated is uh, 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 heparin sulfate uh, 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 has been used for therapy for uh, um, anti-clothing disseminated intravascular uh, uh, coagulation and so on. Yeah so that I mean a fantastic question and all all things that I've, are really important. The only caveat in me answering those is that it goes slightly outside my experimental experience. But from what I'm gathering, um, you know, I think that the targeting, or the virus actually binding to those heparins are going to be quite a significant part of its, uh, of its biology. And in terms of the sensitivity to modifications, by sulfation, et cetera, um, I think the starting point would be it will be impacted by those modifications rather than assuming that it won't be. Um, but I haven't seen data to support that. It doesn't mean it doesn't exist. But uh, yeah, it's, it's a really important feature and, and could well reveal, you know, some of the tissue tropisms or variation between people. All of this would be very interesting. Uh, David Ho. Uh, Max, uh, could you comment on how glycans near the receptor binding domain may affect uh, RBD directed antibodies? RBD. So, uh, overall, I would say that the, um, the glycan density is sufficiently low that even if there are uh, glycans in proximity, I don't think that's going to have a big quantitative difference in terms of the ability of the immune system to be, to be recognizing it. That's my, again, my starting point. I was actually really uh, intrigued to see that example I showed where, you know, antibodies can recognize and incorporate uh, even the base of the carbohydrate modification. So, so far, I think the, the jury would be keep an eye on it, but it's probably not going to be uh, a huge problem. I mean, that's subject to revision, obviously, but that's, that's where I'd start with that one. Thank you. Okay, Raul? All right, um, just a, a question. Is there anything known about uh, how the different hosts uh, in cervical viruses, I mean, how this process depends on bats or different hosts in, in other cervical viruses, I mean, in SARS-CoV or in any of the, of the bat species? And what can be the function, if any, in, in uh, any other species? Well, superb question. Uh, this one uh, weighs on my mind quite a lot because obviously transmission of viruses within the human population is using human sugars. I'm just rephrasing your question for the benefits of everybody. And, but when you look at transmission between species, you have a sort of uh, glycobiology conversion from going from bat sugars to human sugars. And that's important because carbohydrates can be readily recognized by antibodies. It, carbohydrates, for example, are the basis of blood groups. And we know that blood group incompatibility can actually limit viral transmission even in humans. So when we look across species, you do, you know, those, those antibody responses can offer some degree of, um, of a barrier for interspecies transmission. And one thing that's been uh, weighing on my mind is, are there particular species where, because of the similarities um, or the, of glycans, are, they, are you going to have more readily trans, uh, transmission versus others? Um, that could well be true. Or uh, do you have particular trafficking routes 
uh, because of particular sugars. And I think that's very true in some of the flaviviruses where you've got insect derived glycans. That's going to have a quite pronounced impact on glycans versus mammal to mammal transmission. Um, but yes, it's really it's going to be super important. There's scope if there are particularly antigenic glycans present on bats. And from my knowledge of bats, I think they are unfortunately more similar rather than different to humans. So, uh, you know, this, this may be a, not such a fruitful line to go with. But yeah, certainly when you look at bigger, um, in other viruses where there are bigger changes in zoonotic events, that could be a real uh, way of inspiring different vaccine approaches or therapy. So do you think that can contribute so, to... Well, uh, uh, sorry, one, one question only because you're running over time. Um, so in, uh, in the interest time, one last question uh, from Margaret Crosby Arnold, and then we'll have uh, to move to the next speaker. Larry, uh, if you can post your question on the Q&A box, uh, we'll, we'll forward to uh, Dr. Crispin. Thank you so much for your talk. Um, the UK seems to be having a similar uh, issue as the United States in terms of the um, disproportionate uh, impact and deaths amongst people of color. Can you speak about that um, from the standpoint of your research on uh, glycan analysis? Um, well, only in that um, when we look at glycobiology, we're all very, very similar. So, um, you know, we're, we're united by our biochemistry, which is quite reassuring uh, thought in, my, in many ways. Um, no, I, I'm afraid I can't comment on, on what might be behind those, those statistics. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Crispin.